to abridge the activities of a church. Hubbard found the perfect cathedral for his church, St. Hill Manor, in East Grinstead in Sussex. <laughs> And it's safe to assume that he became a religion because he could keep more of the money. Correct. Well, one thing about uh, that form of corporation uh, is that uh, it's uh, pretty easy to uh, move money and what have you about. This 1972 directive that the FBI seized is a frank statement of one of Hubbard's aims. Item A, make money. Down the list, item J also reads, make money. Item K make more money, and item L, make other people produce so as to make money. According to L. Ron Jr., his father wasn't morally concerned with using Scientology money for illicit black market business deals. Profits from the bestseller went not to religion, says his son, but to the importing of drugs. We finished the money. I went around, I went along to guard the money, um, and uh, through uh, mafia friends of his, we imported uh, uh, cocaine and heroin through Columbia. People were giving you money to get happiness, religion, some learning, and you were going to Mexico and Colombia with your father to buy drugs, marijuana and cocaine, correct? The newspapers were accusing him of being a fraud and lobbied the government to launch an inquiry. When the fire goes off, you know by the number that went off? Hubbard decided there was only one answer. He would take to the high seas. With his loyal band of disciples, he would move himself and his empire outside any government's jurisdiction. At one point, he turned around and said to us in a very sort of masterful um, way, in a very uh, almost ambassadorial sort of way, he said, um, it's perfectly all right to step outside the law because the law itself is aberrated. So in order to achieve our ends, that gives us license to step outside the law. Hubbard's followers were about to see the consequences of life beyond the law, as the Messiah became their dictator. The attacks on Scientology had pitched Hubbard into one of his periodic depressions. His response was to take it out on his followers on sea and land. He designed a new disciplinary code called Ethics, which put many of them into what he called lower conditions of existence, like liability, doubt, or treason. To rise out of these conditions, penances were required. Liability, for example, required you to deliver an effective blow to Scientology's enemies. What happened was it became a very heavy, almost military organization. People changed. I think people became scared. They were scared of ethics, scared of what would happen. And so they became, I think, very intimidated. At sea, the cruelty extended to children. On one occasion, Hubbard was infuriated by a small boy who had unwittingly chewed a telex. He put this four-and-a-half-year-old little boy, Derek Green, into the chain locker for two days, two days and two nights. It's a closed metal container. It's wet. It's full of water and seaweed. It smells bad. But Derek was sitting up on the chain in this place on his own in the dark for two days and two nights. He was not allowed to go to the party. I mean, he had to go in the chain locker on his own, soil himself. He was given food. And uh, I, was, I never went near it, uh, the chain locker, while he was in there, but people heard him crying. Um, that is sheer total brutality I, that is that that's um, that's a child abuse people were in awe of him and people were frightened of him he was the boss he was the dictator he could order anyone to do anything on board when John McMasters was on Hubbard's flagship the Apollo in the late 60s he witnessed Hubbard's drug supply and commented it was the largest drug chest I had ever seen he had everything drugs in any way. No, never. No drugs. 
Besides Hubbard's association with illicit and prescription drugs, there are witnesses who report seeing numbers of blank prescription notes just waiting to be filled. Ron had a penchant for both booze and cigarettes. Eyewitness accounts record that Ron could drink with the best of them and operate quite well under excessive amounts of booze, possibly indicating the aid of bennies or other stimulants in order to keep himself functioning. As for smoking, L. Ron is said to have smoked upwards of four packs a day and had the following advice for his followers, many of whom chain smoke in imitation of their main man, Ron Hubbard. So I thought it might be a good thing to know in the event of a tonic war that uh, we would get... Uh, we would, might, might have some chemical assist, so maybe the people who were only slightly frazzled and so forth could, could come out of it. And it would have to be very simple. It would have to be a, some common drug, some common pill. Well, there's societies in England that are having an awfully good time fighting the cigarette. They can't do anything else, so they fight cigarettes. And uh, they say uh, that the cigarette causes lung cancer. And they, you've been hearing something of this, I'm sure. Yeah, not smoking enough will cause lung cancer. <laughs> not smoking enough will cause lung cancer. <laughs> if anybody is getting a cancerous activity in the lung, uh, the probabilities are that it's radiation dosage coupled with the fact that he smokes. And what it does is start to run out the radiation doses, don't you see? But I'd say that would be better than not running out any of the radiation doses at all. And the number of lung cancer cases, which exist, of course, that don't smoke, are just forgotten about by these societies, but they are very numerous. Anyway, there's nicotinic acid in that cigarette. Inevitably, on inhalation of tobacco, you will get some of this phenomena of face flush. But in view of the fact that a cigarette isn't pushing its smoke over the outside of the body, but on the inside, of course, you run it out internally. Ron claimed that the nicotine in cigarettes would turn into nicotine acid, a component of vitamin B, which would drive out radiation from the body, including forms of cancer. He recommended cigarettes as a way for people to recover their health in the event of a nuclear war. Ron's nubile teenage female messengers would follow him around with an ashtray and smokes, lighting a fresh cigarette at his chain-smoking lips as another was just butted in the ashtray. There would be six messengers on duty when he was filming. One would hold his chair, one would hold a packet of cigarettes, and as soon as she saw that the cigarette he had was going out, would have to light another and give it to him. One held the ashtray, one held his pen, and so on. There were six of them round him. One of them was put on the humiliating rehabilitation project force, where she probably served for several months because she didn't get a chair there. Back. The Commodore's messengers. They took care of everything for him. They dressed him, they got him ready for bed, they lit his cigarettes, they held his ashtray. And most of the messengers are young girls, 13, 14, 15. They were an extension of his communication. So when somebody saw them on the ship or they came up to them, it was like you were talking to him. On one occasion, Jerry Armstrong, who had been sent on a shore errand, was visited by one of Hubbard's messengers. This was uh, Terry, who was later to be my wife, and she came to me where I was working, and she said, the Commodore wants to know, is it true that you went to the U.S. Embassy and applied for 30-some-odd visas? And I said, yes, sir, because that's how you respond to the messenger. And her next message was, the Commodore says you're a fucking asshole. Nobody could say Ron was afraid of the needle. In his earlier years, Ron suffered a recurrent bout of venereal disease for which he took sulfur. He feared this had affected his libido in the most detrimental way, and later in his life he would inject himself with testosterone, recording in his affirmations, Testosterone blends easily with your own hormones. Your glands already make plenty of needed testosterone, and by adding to that store you make yourself very thrilling and sexy. Testosterone increases your sexual interest and activity. It makes erections easier and harder and makes your own joy more intense. Still, Bestrol in 5 milligram dose makes you thrill more to music and color and makes you kinder. 
You have no fear of what any woman may think of your bed conduct. You know you are a master. You know that they will be thrilled. You can come many times without weariness. The act does not reduce your vitality or brain power at all. You can come several times and still write. Intercourse does not hurt your chest or make you sore. Your arms are strong and do not ache in the act. Your own pleasure is not dependent on the woman's. You are interested only in your own sexual pleasure. If she gets any at all, that's all right, but not vital. Many women are not capable of pleasure in sex, and anything adverse they say or do has no effect whatsoever upon your pleasure. Their bodies thrill you. If they repel you, it merely means they themselves are too frigid or prudish to be bothered with. They are unimportant in bed, except as they thrill you. Your sexual power is magnificent, and they know it. If they are afraid of it, that is their loss. You are not affected by it. According to statements made by attorney Michael Flynn, Hubbard, until at least February of 1980, filled out fraudulent doctor's prescription for a large array of medical drugs for himself. It was shown in the Armstrong trial in Los Angeles in 1984 that Hubbard even had blank prescription slips from the U.S. Navy, one of which had a prescription for phenobarbital, a habituant hypnotic, written in Hubbard's handwriting. One can only speculate what drugs Ron was taking when he came up with the following concept of body thetans and discussed his out-of-body visitations to other planets. Said, although I don't think you'd have very much pleasure out of kissing a girl from Jupiter, that's a heavy uh, gravity planet, <laughs> uh, if you stepped on the planet Jupiter in one of these meat bodies that you presently have, you would become a pancake promptly. You see? And what atmosphere it has lies in seas of liquid air and so on. We might say this is somewhat rigorous as an environment, not completely similar to Russia, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> well, so you do get these various variations. And uh, it's not all that horrifying, however. You find somebody running around planet Jupiter, he'd be built to withstand that climatic uh, condition and that gravitic condition and so forth. And his legs might be a bit modified and his arms and that sort of thing, but he probably would look like an Eskimo. I was up in the Van Allen belt. This is uh, factual. And uh, I don't know why they're scared of the Van Allen belt, because it's simply hot. Uh, you'd be surprised how warm space is. Hubbard said he had discovered secrets of the universe so powerful they could only be heard by Scientologists who had spent hundreds of hours studying his programs. Anyone else would be struck dead by the knowledge. He told stories of how 75 million years ago an evil tyrant collected beings on other planets to be stored in volcanoes on Earth. Boxed them up in boxes, threw them into space planes. DC-8 airplane is the exact copy of the space plane of that day. And uh, no difference, except the DC-8 had fans, propellers on it, and the space plane didn't. The upper-level courses are called OT, which stands for Operating Thetan, Hubbard's word for the spirit. The OT levels are supposedly so powerful that you can die of pneumonia if you're exposed to them unprepared. It costs around £5,000 to take OT3, which contains Hubbard's cosmology. The church has tried to keep this material secret, but former senior Scientologists in America have leaked it, and versions have been published. This is an outline of the story. 75 million years ago, this planet was called Tigiak. There were 90 planets in this sector called the Galactic Confederation. This is part of the text of a Hubbard lecture. They had elected a fellow by the name of Zemu to the supreme ruler. And they were about to unelect him. And he took the last moments he had in office to really goof the floof. Zemu decided to take radical measures to overcome the population problem. Beings were captured on other planets and flown to locations near ten volcanoes or more on Earth. H-bombs were dropped on the volcanoes destroying the body